Hello friends. Welcome to Ultimate Fan Fiction. How are you all? So we are back with an interesting series on what if Naruto was the king of the chakra beasts. Also be sure to subscribe and like this video. Now let's begin. Ooh, I think I felt him kick, a brown haired woman said. Really? Was it strong? Is he gonna be a kicker? Was it a sidekick? A front kick? Or maybe even a spinning back kick? Which is it? I need to know. The blonde haired man who sat beside her replied. How should I know? He's just a baby, his legs aren't fully developed yet. Besides, I don't think he's ready to pull off any spinning back kicks just yet, the woman said back with a laugh. I know. I just want to make sure that when he's old enough, I can train his strengths to their best so that he doesn't miss out, he said with a soft smile as he thought about teaching his son in the future. He could already picture giving his son his first headband, teaching him plenty of powerful ninjutsus and making sure he was a splendid ninja who had an excellent career as a shinobi of the hidden leaf. This particular man had been born to a civilian family and even though his parents were loving and he had a very happy family, he simply wasn't raised as a ninja. Luckily, he had simply been born to be a ninja, but if he hadn't he probably would have died on his very first mission. Before we figure out how to train him, I should probably have him first. Don't you think? The woman said back as she bursted out in a huge laugh. I guess you're right, the man replied as he slumped over and laid on his wife's lap in defeat. The expecting parents who were discussing their first child with such excitement were none other than Minato Namikaze, the Hidden Leaf's fourth and current Hokage and Benzaiten Serutobi, the daughter of the Hidden Leaf's last Hokage, Hirazen Serutobi, and Minato's advisor. The two had essentially been the Leaf's power couple in multiple senses. First, Minato was the Leaf's strongest shinobi and Benzaiden was no one to take lightly in terms of power either. Secondly, they had some of the highest political power in the village, the Hokage being the leader and Benzaiden being his second in command. And finally, they along with two other shinobi, had been the Leaf's main war power. Benzaiden, Minato, Fugaku Uchiha, and Kashina Uzumaki would be sent as a four-person squad to fight entire armies and would come back without so much as a scratch. The two had been a couple since young teens and had been dreaming of starting a family together for a while. Especially since the Third Great Ninja War had ended. It had been especially hard on Minato as he had lost two of his students who were like his younger siblings. Now they could finally have a change of pace and be a little more upbeat and happy. Benzaden would never forget the day that Minato came back home with the body of his student Rin. The girl showed promise as a great healer and to just see her lifeless body broke the woman as much as it had broken the girl's teacher. Flashback Minato and Kakashi Hitaki, the man's student were walking into the village with their heads hung low. Benzaden ran to give the team a hug in excitement but was shocked to just see Kakashi and Minato with faces of shame and anguish. Especially Kakashi, who looked to be trying his hardest to hold back tears. Where are Rin and Obito? Benzaden asked desperately hoping for a different response than the one she knew was coming. Dead, Kakashi said softly as he began walking past the woman to get home head still face towards the floor. While this was going on, Minato pulled a scroll from behind his back and unsealed it, what came out was a very pretty young girl who stared lifelessly into the air. And Obito? Benzaden asked, as her lips began to tear and she tried to choke back sobs. He was sealed in a cave. He saved Kakashi from being crushed by a boulder and was crushed in his place, Minato said ashamedly. If only I had been there. They were just kids. They had no business being sent into battle without supervision, Minato said angrily. Minato knew that shinobi died, and even though they were kids, they were shinobi. But this was different to him. These kids were under his authority and he was supposed to be the fastest shinobi alive, and he could only save Kakashi. End flashback. I can't believe that he'll be here next month. It seems like it was just yesterday when you told me that you were pregnant. I just really hope that I'll be a good father. What if I work him too hard? Or what if I'm too busy as a Hokage to make time for him? Or what if I'm too cold? Or what? Shish, Benzaden said. The fact that you, Minato Namikaze one of the smartest shinobi I've ever met and one of the smoothest planners I've seen in action is spiraling over a baby who hasn't even taken his first breath, should tell you all you need to know. And remember, you aren't gonna be the only one who has to figure things out for him, we're a team in this. Besides, if he's anything like you were he'll basically raise himself. Benzaden reassured. And if he's anything like you or I'm gonna need every ninja in the hidden leaf on high alert at all times, Minato joked which earned him a slap to the back of the head. 
while the couple sat in the comfort of their home joking and spending time just enjoying each other's presence, little did they know that a man had been sitting outside listening to every word they spoke and analyzing each and every movement they made with extreme precision, making sure not even a single facial gesture went unnoticed. Minato and Benzaden were sitting in their house when a large explosion was heard. He looked out the window and his face turned into one of horror when he realized what the explosion was. Today was the day of Hiyashi Hayuga and Kashina Uzumaki's first child. And it seems that somehow, the Ninetales fox had been unsealed. It's the Ninetales. Benzaden go into the bunker, Minato shouted. Immediately she did as instructed and opened a hatch on the floor and ran down the flight of stairs, cradling her stomach as she went. When she entered the bunker she ran into a room that stopped all forms of raw chakra from entering and made using jutsu inside the room impossible. While she entered the room, Minato used his flying rage and jutsu to teleport into the center of Konoha in order to face off with the beast. He bit his thumb and weaved hand seals slamming his hands on the floor. A strange marking appeared as his blood marked the ground. One giant toad appeared under Minato that was a burgundy and then one small green toad appeared on his right shoulder and a small purple one on his left. The toads were Lord Fukasaku a toad sage, Lady Shima another sage, and Chief Gamabunta, the leader of the toads. He has summoned them right in front of the Ninetales which had caused Lady Shima and Chief Toad to be silent. Fukasaku who hadn't yet looked at the beast, was just confused. What seems to be the problem boy? Fukasaku asked before looking up. Ah! Fukasaku shouted in realization when he realized that they were face to face with the Ninetales demon fox. So, what's the plan? Shima asked, seal the Ninetales in Lady Kashina or her child and try not to die, Minato replied. Good plan. Gamabunta shouted as he drew his sword and hopped. Time skip. Twelve years later, Sumahiko, you're gonna be late, Benzaden shouted from the kitchen. A boy with brown hair was laying on his bed snoring. He was sprawled out on his bed in his tank top and shorts, no clue in the world that he was getting ready to miss what would be one of the biggest days in his entire life. Sumahiko, don't make me go up there, Benzaden said once again. A primal fear had awoken when those words were spoken into the air. The boy immediately jumped out of his bed with bright green sheets and ran into his bathroom. He took a shower, brushed his teeth, washed his face, brushed his hair, and put on deodorant. He then ran back into his room, put on a new tank top and put on his baggy black pants and his black hoodie with the green top section and his black and gold boots. He neglected fixing his bed or cleaning his room in any meaningful way in order to preserve time. He jumped down the stairway and landed before running straight into the kitchen. The counters were littered with pictures of Minato, Sumahiko, Benzaden, and their extended families. Today's a big day. You're gonna become a full-fledged ninja. That means missions and training and fighting stealthily. You know, if you want to back out, it's still not too late. I know a man who needs a metalworking apprentice and would be willing to take you in if you want. Metalwork is just as important, if not more important than being a shinobi. After all, a shinobi without weapons goes through chakra a bit too quickly, Benzaden said. Even though she would never say it in front of her son, she truly wished he would go on a different path from the one the rest of his family had gone on. She had watched many of her close friends and even her husband lose their lives to the cruel shinobi world and she didn't know if she could stand the death of her only child. No thanks, mom. It's all up from here. I bet I'll get a cool sensei who will teach me a bunch of cool jutsu. I'll win the chunin exams and then everybody will want me to do jobs for them. I'm gonna be super rich and famous and maybe even more well known than dad was, Sumahiko said. Even though Sumahiko looked up to his father, he had a form of resentment for him. His father had died battling the Ninetales and sealing it inside some baby girl and because of that his mother always looked sad and he had never gotten to meet him. Although he understood that Minato may have been the only person who could have beaten the Ninetales, it still hurt. I'm sure you will. She smiled softly at the boy who resembled Minato so closely. It was such a shame that the man who was so excited to be a father never even got to see the boy's face in person. But, assuredly Minato was gazing down upon the two he had left behind watching Sumahiko grow to become the strong shinobi he was growing into and the fine young man he was turning out to be and was watching Benzaden continue to be the fighter that he had fallen in love with all those years ago. Now eat quickly, you have to be at school in ten minutes. Got it mom. Sumahiko hurriedly shoved his plate consisting of eggs, sausage, bacon, 
pancakes, and toast into his mouth and guzzled down his watermelon juice before kissing his mom on the cheek and running out the door. Love you, he shouted as he ran down the street as fast as he could. Young Lord. Sumahiko heard from multiple people as he ran down the street at breakneck speeds hoping that he wouldn't be late for his official ninja ranking. Sumahiko arrived as two ninjas were just shutting the doors that he dived right between and landed quickly made his way to his seat next to Hanada Hayuga. H. Hey, Sumahiko, the girl stuttered out, trying to engage in conversation for the 100th time, even though her shyness almost always got the best of her. Hanada was an interesting looking girl to say the least. She had navy blue hair with red flares at the end of a few sections. She had white irises and no visible pupils. The Hyuga were already an eccentric looking clan, but Hanada took it to a completely different level. Though, Sumahiko didn't mind this in the slightest. However, being that she got red like she was angry whenever he tried to talk to her and that she spoke in very short, very quiet sentences to him on the very off chance that she talked to him at all, he came to the conclusion that she must not like him very much. Hey, Lady Hanada. I can't believe we're finally going to become ninjas today. I'm gonna become a crazy strong ninja. Then all the girls will forget about Sasuke finally. Sumahiko was no stranger to affection in his class but he wanted all of it. Unfortunately for him, it was divided between himself and Sasuke Uchiha. Sasuke was a black-haired emo who barely said three words most of the time and when he would talk he would mostly just talk down to his classmates. Sumahiko never could see why the girls were so interested in the guy that treated them all like crap. Okay. Hanada mumbled and went back to her normal daily routine of just sitting down, staring at the board in the front of the classroom with her lowered ever so slightly. Iruka Amino, the teacher of the classroom, walked in shortly after Sumahiko and Hanada's short conversation. He had brown hair, a scar across his face, and wore the standard Konoha uniform of a green flak jacket as well as a navy blue long sleeve undershirt and cargo pants. Good morning class, I'm sure you are all excited as you know what today is. The students cheered and whooped acknowledging today would be the day that they finally became genin. So today, we'll be doing a logic test before we get into the ninja tools and jutsu test and if caught cheating, your test will be invalidated and you will be expelled and never allowed to return to this school again. Is that understood? Yes sir. The class all shouted in unison. Okay, you will have two hours to complete this test. There will be basic comprehension, math, science, and shinobi history on it, is that clear? Yes sir. The class repeated. The test was then handed out after a few minutes of preparation and made to commence. Time skip 30 minutes in, which of the following rogue ninja squads were responsible for the death of the second Hokage? A Lightning Dragons B Kinkaku Force C Death Reapers. Sumahiko read the questions carefully before picking his answer. Should be C, he thought to himself as he circled his answer. What Keke Jenke is used as its own military corp in the Hidden Stone? A Lava Release B Storm Release C Explosion Release. This is easy. He said as he circled C this continued as he picked multiple answers some right some wrong. After time continued to go on eventually the test ended. Sumahiko was relatively confident in his answers as he ended up giving his sheet of paper to Aruka. Using a jutsu Aruka was able to immediately give Yosuke his answer. 70%. Well at least you passed. But now you have to be very careful as one slip up could mean failing this year. Sumahiko's sweat dropped at the thought of not graduating. His mom would kill him, his grandfather would be so disappointed, and worst of all, Konohamaru, his younger cousin, would never let him live it down. He could imagine it. All the clever insults the kid would come up with. He could not fail this year. Don't worry sir, I'll make sure to wow you with this next test. Next came the shuriken test. As Sumahiko promised he easily hit each target dead center with his shuriken. And finally came the jutsu test. Sumahiko easily passed these as well as Sumahiko had learned multiple jutsus from his family and these were so low level that he had no problem doing them. Time skipped three hours later the class had all done their ninjutsu test and all had passed, all except for Hinata. Sumahiko was saddened by this as even though she didn't seem to like him, he was hoping to be placed on the same team as her and maybe show her he was cool. Now there would be no way that could happen. I'm sorry Hinata. Maybe next year, Aruka said. Thank you, sir, the girl replied dejectedly, as she walked out of the classroom, head hung low. 
Sumahiko noticed Mizuki following the girl outside of the classroom but before he could try to see what was going on his family bursted into the room. Mizuki was Aruka's assistant and always a bit sketchy to Yosuke but he couldn't really focus on that. I knew you would do it. I'm gonna teach you an extra special ninjutsu as my gift to you, Benzaden shouted. My first grandson to become a ninja. Congratulations my boy. I know you've got a bright future ahead of you, Hirazan, the former Hokage said. Who knows you might even be on my team only time will tell, said Asuma, Benzaden's youngest brother and elite Jonin. Just because you became a ninja before me doesn't mean you're gonna be ahead of me forever, so you better keep training. Konohamaru the youngest of the main Serutobi family and son of Benzaden's older brother. Them and multiple other Serutobis came in to celebrate the success of their future clan head. However, Sumahiko had been in his own little world thinking about Hinata. The Serutobis ended up throwing a massive party for the new genin but he went outside, claiming he wanted to get a breath of fresh air. However, after making sure no one was watching him, he began dashing at full speed toward the Hyuga Manor. After arriving, he knocks on the door. He had been worried about Hanada and felt the need to check on her to make sure she was okay. The door opens and Sumahiko sees Hiyashi Hayuga staring down at him. This man was none other than the fifth Hokage. He was on Minato's team when they were genin and had been one of the most powerful ninjas in the entire Hidden Leaf. Sumahiko had never met the man in person and mentally slapped himself for not figuring that the Hokage would be at his own home at night. He was tall and had an imposing stature with the same white eyes that Hanada had, except they had a coldness to them that even made the normally dauntless Sumahiko shiver. Hello sir. I came here to see Hanada. Oh. She said that she was meeting with a teacher for remedial classes so she might graduate in the next couple of months. He gave this information to Sumahiko with ease which surprised the Serutobi. Sumahiko had always thought the Hayuga to be a stern group of people with sticks up their asses but maybe not. Okay. Thank you sir. With that, Sumahiko was on his way home. That was until, he heard a clash of metal coming from the forest he was walking by. He quickly leapt through the trees to see Hanada holding an oversized scroll as well as holding a kanai that she used to clash with Mizuki, the teacher who had pulled away the Hyuga princess earlier. She had been using her by a kugan, which made the veins near her eyes visible and alerted Sumahiko to the gravity of the situation. Mizuki who had just noticed Yosuke began trying to entice him. Quickly, young lord, I found this girl attempting to steal the Hokage's sacred treasure. Hanada's face turned white when she heard this. Sumahiko was ridiculously powerful and she had already been tired from fighting a chunin. Oh, really? Sumahiko said. Well I guess I'll have to take care of her. Sumahiko began weaving hand seals. Wind style, great breakthrough. Right before he began the stream of wind, he did a flip, allowing the wind to burst from his mouth while he was upside down smacking Mizuki in the chest and making him slam into the tree. How could you sensei? You're supposed to be our teacher. How could you? You're protecting the beast that killed your father. What would your mother say? What are you talking about? Sumahiko asked, a look of confusion growing on his face. Mizuki sneakily began weaving hand seals and grabbed a myriad of shuriken from his bag. The nine tails demon fox that killed Lord Forth, that beast is held within that girl. Sumahiko looked at Hanada who just had a look of shame painted across her face. You see, she won't even deny it because she knows it's true. She's responsible for the deaths of countless innocent people. Why do you think she's been all alone this entire time? A clan head? It should make sense when you think about it for a second. So, Sumahiko said, resolve growing in his heart. If anything, I should be thanking her for the lives of myself and my mother. If it weren't for her, the entire village would have been destroyed and my entire family would have died. The only monster I see here is you. That's enough out of you, Mizuki shouted. He threw the shuriken he had picked up at Hanada and used his chakra to coat them in lightning. Sumahiko decided to jump in front of the weapons in order to stop them from hitting the girl. He fell off the tree they were standing on hitting multiple branches before landing on the ground with a thud. Hanada watched as the boy who had just been shouting her praises and even seemingly sacrificed himself for her died. Her Byakugan changed from white to pink as her pupils became black visible slits. She put her fingers together and called out. Shadow Clone Jutsu. Mizuki was bewildered. Only a select few cage would have enough chakra to pull off a feat like this and not immediately die from the immense chakra it would take. Hanada. A voice called out, 
it had been Iruka sensei he saw hanada getting ready to beat mizuki into a pulp and sumihiko laying down on the ground unresponsive but what shocked him even more was the sheer amount of clones hanada had made charge hanada shouted the clones all began beating mizuki to a pulp some closing chakra points and others just pummeling him while watching Aruka noticed that instead of the usual blue that glows over a Hyuga's hands, while using the gentle fist, the chakra was red, but he decided to keep that to himself. When the brutal beat down was over, Mizuki was barely alive. 90% of his chakra points were closed, all of his organs were bruised, some even ruptured, and most of his bones were broken. Hanada, since you were able to stop a potential threat to the village, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to become a ninja, Aruka said, with a sigh of relief. Hanada cheered before realizing what had just happened. She jumped off of the branch she had been standing off and saw Sumahiko standing on the ground rubbing his head and removing the weaponry that had been lodged into his chest, shoulders, and stomach. Luckily Mizuki seemed to be a terrible shot and didn't hit anything vital. You're alive. Hanada shouted with the most enthusiasm Sumahiko had ever seen from her. Please, a guy like that could never actually beat me, Sumahiko retorted rubbing under his nose with his right index finger. You mister. Sumahiko awaited the scoldings that he had become accustomed to from his sensei. Nicely done, Aruka said patting the boy on the head. By now, it was getting ready to be morning and there were search parties looking all over for the two genin. Spotted them. A Hyuga shinobi shouted. Mizuki was arrested and locked away while Sumahiko and Hanada were taken home to get rest and wait for the next week that they would wait before being placed on their teams. After the events of a couple nights prior, Sumahiko had been resting and recovering from his injuries but now it was time for business. Benzaden had woken Sumahiko up at around 4 am in order to begin some training. She walked him to the Serutobi training ground. Sumahiko had four more days till team selection and Benzaden would be damned if her son wasn't the leader of the pack in strength since he was far from the brainiest of the class. Mom. Why are we here? Sumahiko said with an exhausted yawn. He wasn't used to waking up so early even for school so he was insanely exhausted. I promised to teach you a new jutsu didn't I? If you're gonna learn it, you need time to practice it, don't you think? Benzaden asked. Fair enough. Sumahiko yawns out a bit dejectedly. He was still wearing his pajamas and was in no way ready for training on any level. However, a new jutsu is a new jutsu and if he was lucky his mom would be teaching him something crazy. Back when I was a bit older than you when I wanted to see your father and your grandfather wouldn't let me leave, I invented this jutsu to be able to escape the window which was a few stories high. She weaved a few hand seals and said, wind release, air step. She began jumping off of the air a couple of times, shocking Sumahiko immediately. He had never heard of ninjas being capable of flying and his mom was just able to do it so casually. She eventually landed after her tenth step. So this jutsu is relatively simple but it works amazingly well. You use wind release to solidify the air underneath your feet and hop off of it. Only weaknesses are it takes timing to land on the air constructs, it's invisible so you need to be really careful to make sure you step on the right place, the solid air only lasts a couple seconds unless you pour more chakra into it, and every step you take drains some chakra. That's insane, mom. You can actually fly. How am I supposed to fly? I didn't even know flying was possible. I'm gonna be able to fly. When are you gonna teach me? How are you gonna teach me? Sumahiko was befuddled to say the least at the notion of flight for himself, his mother, and shinobi period and Benzaden was shocked at how annoying her son could actually be. She put her finger to his mouth and shushed him. If you want to learn, stop talking and watch me. I've already shown you once, I'm gonna show you this one more time and then you're on your own. Benzaden said in a stern voice immediately bringing Sumahiko's attention to her and clearing the clouds out of his head. The mother went through the hand seals and demonstrated the jutsu once more. Remember it's important to time when you solidify the air just right. Go, and the air falls apart before you land on it. Go too late, and you wind up with some nasty scars from getting cut. Benzaden pulled up her pant leg and showed her shins riddled with scars from slash wounds she had received in her youth when she had just conceived the jutsu. Now I want you to work on this until you can land perfectly every single time and make sure you only go up a few feet in the air because if you lose control or run out of the necessary chakra without the ability to land you're gonna be in trouble. And not with me, but with the Lord himself. After giving her pep talk, Benzaden scruffled the boy's hair and walked back to her house. She then shouted back, come inside, 
change your clothes, and eat a fruit. You're not getting any breakfast until you can pull off at least three in a row in the air. Sumahiko sighed and began running back to his home. And thus began Sumahiko's four days from hell. He took a shower, took the time to fix his bed, changed into his signature outfit, grabbed an apple and went back to the training field to practice the jutsu he was instructed to learn. He weaved the hand seals for the technique, shouted the name, and jumped up to land on the air, but instead bonked his head as he had accidentally made it over his head instead. This went on for a couple of hours as Sumahiko got multiple nicks, bruises, and scratches as he repeatedly tried to land on the air with success being few and far between the massive failures. He couldn't understand how he had such a hard time learning a jutsu his mom said was simple. Sumahiko was a prodigy in every sense of the world. His grasp on taijutsu was amazing, at his young age, he could already use a few jutsu from the two chakra natures he knew, and his genjutsu prowess was nothing to sneeze at either. But this jutsu that couldn't be anything higher than C rank was seemingly impossible for him to learn. Hanada Pav Hanada was sitting in the Hokage's office with her father. Everyone thought of her father as this strict, responsible, stoic man, but Hanada knew who her father really was. She watched as Hiyashi did his best to try to flick a piece of paper he had folded into the shape of a triangle in between Hanada's fingers that were positioned with her thumbs touching, her index fingers pointed up, and her other fingers closed. He flicked the paper and it went through the makeshift goal. I win. Hiyashi shouted with excitement. Yes, in reality, the Hokage, the leaf's most powerful shinobi, the strongest member of the five cage, their highest authority, the leaf's last resort, was like a big kid. How could someone like you be Hokage? Hanada asked putting her head in her hands. How could my own darling princess say that to me? Hiyashi said, cartoonist tears running down his face. You can't play one game with your dad. You're becoming a ninja. Soon enough, you'll start going on missions, and ranking up, and then you won't have any time for your father. The Hokage continued to sob as Hanada just shook her head. I came here because I want you to teach me a new technique, but if you're just gonna be annoying I'll go ask a guard, Hanada said, knowing she had no intention of asking a guard for anything. If Hiyashi was anything, he was a doting father. There would be no way he would let anyone steal the time that he'd get to be spending with his rapidly aging daughter. Although he could be bothersome, she did realize that there were some advantages to having the Hidden Leaf's most powerful ninja be wrapped around her finger. No, you don't have to stress the guards like that. I'm more than happy to teach you something, I'll reschedule my meeting with the daimyo for another day. Hiyashi said. He immediately wrote a message and sent a sparrow to deliver it so he could get the father-daughter time he had been craving. Hanada and Hiyashi went to the Hyuga training ground that she had been visiting ever since childhood. Even though I'm happy to spend the time with my beautiful angel, why do you need a new jutsu? You learned the shadow clone from when you stole one of our village's most treasured possessions right? Hiyashi asked jokingly making Hanada laugh nervously. Well, I did, but since that night I've only been able to make around 20 clones at a time and I'm still not that strong physically so the clones aren't that strong. Besides, I thought we could spend some time together, Hanada said, which excited Hiyashi at the thought of his daughter finally being open to hanging out with him. Even though she acted like her father was the most obnoxious person to ever live, Hanada really did love her father. She had never had a mother and even though she had side branch members to teach her about womanhood her father still had been the one to nurture her and get her through all of her trying times in the ways that truly mattered. She respected his strength as well as the fact that he was one of the two last L living members of the team of that was like a second family for him. And with the loss of his twin brother a couple of years ago, she had been of the few strong bonds that had been yet to be severed by the cruelty of the world. Okay, so I think you should learn how to cut ninjutsus. Observe. Hiyashi made a shadow clone. Alright, so I need you to shoot a fireball at me so I can teach Hanada how to cut jutsu. Hanada. The clone said. Where? Do I look bad? He notices her and begins to gush. Oh Lady Hanada looks so beautiful today. I know right. I was just thinking the same thing. Hiyashi and his clone began discussing Hanada's beauty until Hiyashi slapped the clone. Alright, Hanada may look beautiful but we need to focus. The clone nodded and did as he was instructed. Hiyashi focused before putting his index and middle finger together and coating them in chakra. Activate your Byakugan so you can see what I'm about to show you. Hiyashi said in a serious tone. Hanada does so and watched as the chakra in Hiyashi just slices through the fireball like butter. The chakra of the Hyuga is slightly different from other people's. 
Our chakra is good for cutting through chakra and when we weaponize it, we can make almost all jutsu useless in our presence. That's why you don't see most Hyuga using traditional jutsu. Our style relies on using as little chakra as possible with maximum efficiency. As Hiyashi explained this, she began to gain a bit more of a respect for her clan. She always wondered how a clan with such a dainty fighting style could be seen as the strongest clan in the Hidden Leaf and now she's beginning to understand it a bit better. Why would they need to use ninjutsus that burn through so much chakra when they could force a taijutsu battle that they would always have the advantage in? Alright are you ready? Hiyashi asked to which Hanada responded with a nod. Alright fire. The clone did as instructed and launched ball of hellfire at the girl that came careening at ridiculous speeds. This might be too much for her, Hiyashi said in his head. Maybe I should street. Before he even gets to finish his thought he watches as the Byakugan princess lives up to her name and cuts the attack from hell in half which then dissipates to nothingness. Hanada sweats both from the heat from the jutsu and the fear of possibly getting turned into a barbecue. Wow. Even Neji didn't get that on his first try. But I know for a fact that that should have taken more chakra control than she should be able to muster, considering her struggle with the academy techniques. I wonder what's going on in there. I'll put a pin in that for now though. Hiyashi thought as he saw his daughter smile and cheer. Wow that was incredible. I can't believe you did that first try. It takes some of our clansmen years to pull that off, especially with an attack of that magnitude. Hiyashi said. A soft smile spread across Hanada's face which meant the world to Hiyashi. So what else can you teach me? Hanada asked, whoa whoa whoa, you gotta slow your roll. You did a really good job with that technique but that doesn't mean you should automatically move on to the next jutsu. You should go out and see some friends, maybe practice with them a little bit. I'm gonna go back to the office. I didn't expect you to grasp that technique so fast so I'm gonna try to get my meeting with the daimyo back on, Hiyashi said as he began walking away. Dad? Hanada said as Hiyashi was walking. Yes, princess? Hiyashi asked. Thank you for everything, she said with a smile. Hiyashi just snickered. That's what dads are for, he said as he kept walking. She probably thinks I'm so cool now, he thought to himself as he kept walking. Hanada decided she would take her father's advice and began the trek to go into the main area of Konoha. Sasuke's pa of Sasuke had been walking through Konoha in a haze. He had always imagined his parents being there for his graduation as a leaf shinobi. His father finally giving him the praise he had desired for so long, his mother being sweet to him as she always had, and his brother finally accepting him as a fellow shinobi of the hidden leaf. However, Sasuke did not get this nor would he ever. All he got was a congratulations from his teachers and some of the parents that had gone to the graduation to see their children move on to begin their careers. And it was all because of him, the man who had taken everything from him. The same older brother that he had desired to be acknowledged by all those years ago. But now that he'd become a ninja, he'd finally have a chance to give the man what he deserved. To crush his brother completely and make sure he suffered for the murder of the people he loved most dearly. It was all the poor young man had thought of. He had no one so he had nothing to distract him from constantly fantasizing about finally getting even with the bastard that took everything from him. He would get a powerful sensei that would teach him ninjutsus powerful enough to finally rid the world of the insect that was Itachi Uchiha. He was walking through the village in order to get some new ninja tools, some storage scrolls, and see to get to the old Uchiha hideout, the place the Hokage told him he'd have access to once he graduated the ninja academy. Sasuke didn't like most people, but the Hokage was an exception. Hiyashi always took time out of his day in order to check on Sasuke, make sure he was doing okay, and even occasionally teach him a little here and there. However, this had been a secret as someone like the Hokage showing favoritism, even to an orphan, could cause a huge uproar for the Leafs shinobi community. Sasuke got to the weapon store and saw a girl with two brown buns in her hair, a pink suit, gray pants, brown eyes, and a Konoha headband. I need about 20 kanai and 100 shuriken. I pre-ordered them about a month ago, it should be under. Sasuke Uchiha, he said very directly and briefly. A please would be nice, the girl muttered, before shoving a bag into the boy's chest. Thinks he's so much better than me just because he's an Uchiha. I bet he wouldn't be acting like that if Neji were around, the girl said. Sasuke glared at her and then said, I'm not better than you because I'm an Uchiha, I'm better than you because you can't even do your job right. Sasuke said as he went through his bag, noticing multiple chips and scratches in some of his weapons. Hearing that made the girl furious. 
How dare this boy who hadn't even been on his first mission yet talk down to her a genin who had been working for just under a year. You know if you have a problem with me, we can settle it the way ninjas do, the girl replied. Fine by me, though I doubt you'd even be able to land a scratch, Sasuke said. He had been in a mood and although he'd usually just shrug off a nuisance like this one, he decided that he'd test himself against a real genin. The girl changed the sign on her shop from open to closed and locked the doors. Her and Sasuke walked up to an open field and began to square off. I'll give you one chance to beg for my forgiveness before I squash you, the girl said. Sasuke just grunted which made the girl smile. She immediately pulled a scroll from her pocket which began sending mounds of weapons cascading at Sasuke with enough force to lodge themselves deeply into the surrounding trees. The boy knew that if he gets hit even once it would be trouble. However, he wasn't worried in the slightest. Sasuke watched as he found a blade in the stream of metal and began knocking the other blades out of the air as series of clinks and clanks riddled through the air. The ninja he had been fighting was shocked to watch this boy just easily parrying these relatively forceful weapons. She decided to grab a blade of her own and ran up to Sasuke where they began an exchange of swordplay. The girl could tell that Sasuke was relatively inexperienced in swordplay but was baffled at how with every scratch he received he seemed to fight better and better. This girl realized she may have been slightly in over her head and seemed to have underestimated the boy but there was no way she was gonna just let this boy show her up. Before I show you this, I'll at least let you know my name. I'm Tenten Senju and I'm gonna be the greatest Kunoichi to ever live. I'll surpass even the great slug princess Tsunade Senju. Hearing this name caused Sasuke to tense a little before smiling. This is perfect. A Senju who's a higher rank than me. This is gonna be the first real test of my power, Sasuke said, internally. She took another scroll off of her belt and threw it into the middle of the air, where it opened and began raining blades furiously. This girl seemed to have known exactly when and where every blade would be launched as she had no problems, effortlessly dancing around the blades that were being blasted. Sasuke, on the other hand, was put on the back burner. He now had to fend off this troublesome girl's bladed assault while also dodging the rain from hell she set for him. Sasuke leapt backward and reached into his ninja tool pouch. He pulled some shuriken from his back pocket and threw them into the air. Amazingly, the shuriken ricocheted off of each other and the weaponry with such precision that the metallic hail had ceased for just a second. Unfortunately for Sasuke, just a second would not be enough. Tenten flung two kanai at Sasuke who bent down in order to dodge the two blades. Sasuke sighed but not before a couple of shuriken that had happened to have been falling were hit by the kanai and sent barreling toward the already awkwardly positioned Uchiha. He immediately threw himself onto his hands and then kipped up into the air in order to leap over the weapons. Unfortunately, this was right about the time that the volley of weaponry that had been halted so briefly began to pelt the boy again. Sasuke had enough of the onslaught and decided to get rid of the problem the best way he knew how. He jumped into the air, weaving through the blades and weaved hand seals. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Sasuke called. The blast immediately incinerated the scroll and even melted down some of the iron weaponry. The girl was utterly floored to see her jutsu so easily dispatched by someone who didn't even have a team yet. You aren't too shabby. For a newbie that is. Maybe I'll take you a little more seriously. Tenten grabbed a bow staff and ran at Sasuke who had been a bit exhausted from the previous exchange. She swung the metal staff at Sasuke who decided to allow the weapon to get close to him before grabbing the stick and traveling with its momentum. He then planted his foot into the ground and swung Tenten across the field. She let go of the staff and flipped through the air gracefully, landing on her feet. Unfortunately for her, the attention she paid to this maneuver should have been on Sasuke as he appeared right in front of her and slammed his fist straight into her cheek. She flew backward and hit the ground hard, she then began laughing. What's so funny? Sasuke asked angrily. The girl simply pointed upward and Sasuke noticed three scrolls all raining down bladed weapons that the boy simply had no time to dodge out of the way from. He lifted his hands over his head to protect it, but didn't feel the sharp pain come. Shit. Genjutsu. He put his hands together and formed a seal to shock his chakra but when he came to it was too late. Tenten had been holding a kanai to his throat, drawing a bit of blood. We'll call this one my win, little Uchiha, Hanada said, sneering and walking away. Sasuke walked away with an obvious limp and an even more obvious sneer. As he walked, he saw two boys. One with long brown hair and white eyes similar to his classmate Hanada's, 
wearing a cream shirt, black shorts and a bandaged right arm and left leg and a boy with black spiky hair, green eyes, and tan-ish skin wearing a red jacket with a black shirt underneath and black pants. The boy with the black hair began to talk to him. Have you seen our teammate? Her name is Tenton? She was at her shop selling weapons and now she isn't. She has brown hair with two buns and wears a pink shirt. At the training field, Sasuke said angrily, as he continued to limp. Thank you very much. I'm Koen Minara and this is my friend Neji, he said as he sprinted towards the training field. As Sasuke kept walking to Konoha, he saw Sumihiko and Hanada both all walking around in the village. He didn't really mind either of them as despite Sumihiko being a bit of a loud mouth, he definitely had the skill to back it up and Hanada was kind of an inverse of Sumihiko not being the most skilled but being very quiet, unassuming, and polite. The three all looked at each other for a second before all looking back away and going back to live their lives. Damn in ITTTTTTTT, Sumihiko shouted at the top of his lungs, echoing throughout the village. Two days had gone by since Benzaden had instructed the young prodigy to learn the jutsu he had absolutely zero grasp of. He had still been just as stumped as the first time he was shown the technique assigned to him by his mother. His legs were riddled with cuts and scratches from his hundreds of attempts at this seemingly impossible technique. Why the hell can't I do this? Mom says it's a D rank technique at best and I can't even use it once. I bet Sasuke would have been able to do it by now. If he was here, he'd probably be laughing at me. That smug bastard thinks he's the best at everything. I'll show him who's really on top. Sumihiko attempted the technique again, only to jump up, hit his head on a disc of air he hadn't realized he had created, and then hit his face on another one he had accidentally created. He let out a roar and started punching a tree that was on the field. What should have been a peaceful afternoon of rest for the new ninja was a complete nightmare. He had seldom experienced something like this. He picked up almost everything within his first couple of attempts so having to work so hard was foreign to him. At that point, he decided to try to change his angle to learning the ninjutsu. He began running out of the training ground and making his way to the house of one of his clansmen. He arrived at a door and began banging on it. The house was very large and looked rather expensive. It was traditional but at the same time had a modern-esque vibe to it. The house was mainly the color of bamboo with darker and lighter greens spread throughout the residence evenly. Hold on. Hold on. I'm coming, a gruff voice shouted. The door opened and a tall imposing man stepped out of it. It was Asuma, Benzaden's younger brother and Sumahiko's certified confidant. Asuma was relatively young, only being 26 so he was like Sumahiko's older brother, usually being a babysitter when Benzaden was on missions or when she just wanted some free time. He was the one who taught Sumahiko his first ninjutsu, the one who taught him about girls, and the one who taught him about being a man. If Benzaden found out a secret Sumahiko had been harboring for years, Asuma would have been the one helping him hide it when it was first created. Oh, hey Sumahiko. You look like shit. I was just making some lunch, do you want a bite to eat? Well, I guess. But what I really came here for was some help. Mom gave me a jutsu to learn that supposedly a D-rank technique that I can't figure out. It's called the air step. She said she invented it and how it was super simple but I can't even land right. Wow, she's giving him that test. She shouted at dad for months when he had her do it and swore her kid would never be subjected to something like that. I guess dad was really right when he said, you'll understand when you become a parent yourself. Well, I guess if he's taking the test I'll make sure it really works. Asuma thought to himself as a bead of sweat dropped from his forehead. Oh, that. Asuma said. He then began weaving hand seals and started hopping on the air the same way Benzaden had been doing previously. You really can't do it. I figured it out within the first couple of tries after your mom showed me. I thought a supposed super prodigy like you would have learned something like that easily. Sumahiko's face changed from a look of annoyance to one of horror. How did he learn it faster than me? Mom and Gramps said he was the slowest learner in the entire family. What could he have been capable of that I'm not? Sumahiko thought. Why don't you try it in front of me so I can see where you're going wrong? Sumahiko did as instructed and wove the necessary hand seals and attempted the air step once more. He landed on the ground with a painful thud, much to Asuma's delight as he began laughing uncontrollably, to Sumahiko's chagrin. After Asuma finished he scanned Sumahiko. Well, he stared for a second. It seems, maybe. What? Sumahiko bellowed, 
getting annoyed with Asuma's stretching of what the boy deemed to have been a simple explanation. I have no idea, Asuma said with a grin, making his nephew deadpan. To be honest, you did everything just right, you just can't seem to form the air in the right place at the right time. You should probably just keep working on it, you know sometimes even the best ninja can struggle with simple things. No one can be the best at everything. Not you, not my dad, not even your father. Sumahiko just nodded in annoyance and began walking away, as a light breeze began flowing past him. You're not staying for lunch? Asuma asked, a bit surprised as Sumahiko was always a big eater, and was never one to skip out on a meal. I'm serving now and you can leave right after you're done. Nope. I'm gonna go figure this thing out. How are the villagers gonna look at the son of the fourth Hokage if he can't even figure out simple D rank ninjutsus? Sumahiko said dejectedly. Sucks to see him like this but if Sis wasn't teaching him like this, he'd fly into battle with any opponent who he met eyes with and would get killed in his first real combat mission. The bearded man thought this to himself as he pulled out a cigarette and a lighter, lit the cigarette, and took a long drag. Sumahiko decided to go to another place to learn the ninjutsu that had been evading his mastery. The man he wanted to see was his grandfather, the third Hokage who had been rumored to know every single jutsu in the hidden leaf which would obviously include the technique that his mother had shown to him. He arrived at a brown door and knocked on it carefully. This house had been decorated even more ornately than the last. It was fitted with gold, ivory, and the same bamboo color that Sumahiko's uncle seemed to enjoy so much. The door opened to a seemingly shriveled old man whose face lit up with a smile when he saw who was at the door. Sumahiko's respect for his grandfather superseded almost everything else that mattered to him. He had lived through two of the three great ninja wars, was the longest running Hokage, the most powerful Hokage in his prime, which included Sumahiko's father, the oldest a Hokage had ever been, and held two titles the professor, for knowing myriad ninjutsus, including the Hidden Leaf's entire arsenal, and even more importantly, God of Shinobi, for being the most powerful shinobi of his and maybe even all time. Hirazan on the other hand was over the moon about his grandchildren. Due to the turbulence of the time he was Hokage, Hirazan never got to spend much time with his own children, a regret that he had always held in his mind. His entire time as Hokage, he was always afraid that he would never get to see his children grow up and have families of their own. Since he got to meet not one, but two grandsons, he made sure not to take them for granted. Hey Gramps, you look happy. How are you doing? Oh hey Sumi, I'm doing just fine. I just finished lunch and I was getting ready for a walk. How are you? I'm doing good. But, I'm struggling with this jutsu that my mom showed me a couple of days ago. Oh wow. I never thought she would be giving him this lesson after what she said when I gave it to her, Hirazan thought, leading to a little chuckle. Well, what kind of technique is it? It's called the air step. I already went to Uncle Asuma to ask him to help me learn it, but he just said that I need to keep practicing it. But, Mom wants me to learn it before I get assigned to my team. Well, I can't say that I've ever heard of it, could you possibly show it to me? Hirazan asked, innocently. Sumahiko did as instructed, albeit a little surprised at his grandfather not knowing a technique, and showed the old man the hand seals, attempting the jutsu, only to rock it upwards, banging his head on the ceiling, and being caught in the arms of his grandfather. Well, I'll be. A jutsu that allows a ninja to fly, what is this world coming to? Hirazan did the hand seals once and immediately hopped on the air, bouncing all over the house and flying through his door. Wow, what a rush. I wish there was something like this around when I was your age, and for it to be so simple. Hirazan said this and Sumahiko felt his blood begin to boil. If Minato was shown this, he may have really been the strongest Hokage. I don't really know where you could be going wrong on something so easy. What the hell? How can Grandpa just pick it up so quickly? I know he was strong but he's so old now. What does everybody have that I don't? What makes them so much better than me? As Sumahiko thought this, a new thought crossed his mind. Dad would have gotten it on the first try. And any real son of his would have too. When he thought this, he immediately took off on a sprint. Neglecting even bidding farewell to his grandfather. Damn. That son of yours is just like you, Benzaden. As Hirazan said this, Benzaden appeared from the shadows with a frown on her face. Maybe having you mention Monado was a bit much? Benzaden said. Possibly, but I know that this is only bound to make him that much stronger. After all, the will of fire burns brightly in that brat. He wouldn't be the son of you too if it didn't. 
Hiruzen smiled as he said this, causing Benzaden to smile a little as well before putting her head in her hands and groaning. While the two adults were conversing, Sumahiko was running to his happy place, a bench overlooking a small pond. He exited the Serutobi compound and after about five minutes of jogging he got to his destination. His father used to fish there before his death and Sumahiko had always felt closest to his father when he was there. He sat on the bench as tears began to fall down from his face. How am I supposed to be better than dad if I can't even do a simple jutsu right? What's the point of being a prodigy when the first test I get put to is impossible for me to complete? If there are super prodigies like dad out there, how am I gonna stack up against them? There's dad, Gramps, Sasuke, and God knows who else out there who's gonna have more talent than I do. Maybe I'm not cut out to be a shinobi after all. As these thoughts ran through Sumahiko's head, Hanada who had been passing by noticed Sumahiko sitting on the bench and promptly sat next to him with a little blush. Sumahiko immediately noticed her taking the seat and immediately cleaned the tears from his face. Hey, Lady Hanada. What's up? You don't have to call me that. But why were you crying? Sumahiko's face turned white like a ghost when he heard that. He was not accustomed to showing weakness to anybody other than Asuma. His mother had only seen him cry three times since he was eight and none of his classmates had ever seen him cry till this moment. I I wasn't crying. I just got something in my eyes. I swear. Sumahiko said while trying to think his way out of the situation. Great. The one girl in my class who doesn't like me is the one that finds me at my weakest. The other guys in class are gonna grill me more than a family gathering at Choji's when they hear about this. As Sumahiko thought this, Hanada who seemed to be capable of reading the young Serutobi's mind said, Don't worry, I won't tell anybody. But I did see you crying. By a Kugan, remember? She said as she pointed at her white eyes, earning a damn in the mindscape of her classmate. Well, to tell you the truth, my mom showed me a jutsu that I have no grasp on even though everyone else I've talked to about it today was able to pull it off, first try. Hum, could you possibly show me the jutsu? Hanada asked. Immediately Sumahiko replied, No way, I don't think my heart could take the disappointment again. Slumping down as he responded. Well, I guess that idea is dead but, tell me why are you so down about not being able to pick up one jutsu? Last time I checked you were ranked 2 in the entire class. I've never seen you struggle with learning anything other than lectures your entire life. Just because you can't learn one thing doesn't take away from everything else you have learned. Wait, wait, wait. I was ranked number two in the class. Sasuke. That bastard is always stealing my thunder. As Sumahiko began spouting his objections at Sasuke's rank in the class, Hanada interrupted him. There's your problem. Why are you comparing your growth to Sasuke? You had the best taijutsu scores in class. You were also adored by all of the teachers and our classmates. You've always walked to the beat of your own drum in a way that people can't help but to follow. You're a really special person and not being able to figure out one jutsu shouldn't change that for you. Hanada said, her face blushing as she spoke. You know, you're kinda right. I'm pretty great aren't I? Sumahiko said, rubbing the bridge of his nose. So what if I can't learn one shitty jutsu? I'll just learn even better ones. Sumahiko finally was getting out of the depression that his first failure had been bringing him. He grabbed Hanada's hands and said, thanks a lot, you're a real pal. I was completely wrong about you, he began dashing away, headed to his home to have a conversation with his mom. Hanada's face had been bright red until she came to a sinking realization. A real pal? He was completely wrong about me. Just what kind of impression did I leave him in school? What kind of impression did I leave now? Was it not obvious that I like him? Why do boys have to be such idiots? Hanada thought this and smacked her forehead. Sumahiko got to his house, where he found his mother sitting on the couch. Sumahiko's relationship with his mom was complicated, to say the least. His mother had become a bit distant since he decided he was gonna go down the path of a ninja. Asuma and Hiruzen always tried to explain to him that Benzaden had lost a lot of her loved ones due to the hazardous roads Shinobi walked and Sumahiko could understand this to a certain extent but it didn't stop it from hurting him. Benzaden truly did love Sumahiko with all her heart but she was terrified of losing another person close to her. She didn't want to be abandoned by the last piece of her husband that was left behind. Mom. I've decided that your jutsu is stupid. It doesn't matter if I can't do it. I've figured out more than enough jutsus to compensate for 1D rank. And if you don't think everything I have been able to do outweighs this one thing I haven't been, 
then you don't know the first thing about me or ninja at all. As Sumahiko gave his mother his piece, he heard a sniffle. Mom? Are you okay? I'm so. You really have grown up, my beautiful baby boy, Benzaden said, interrupting Sumahiko. What? What are you talking about? Sumahiko asked in confusion. You see, that whole jutsu thing was a test. It's traditional for the Serutobi to test the resolve of the new genin before they actually get assigned to teams to make sure they're ready. It's impossible for you to do at the moment at your current level. Sumahiko was bewildered at this. He had spent all this time, chakra, and effort on a test that he wasn't even meant to pass. Then what was that jutsu that you showed me? It was obviously possible or you, Uncle Asuma, and Gramps wouldn't have been able to do it. First off, I said you wouldn't have been able to do it, Benzaden said sharply before continuing. That technique doesn't actually use wind chakra as solidifying air is insanely impractical and unpredictable. The technique doesn't actually require hand seals. It's actually an advanced form of chakra control that consists of attaching your chakra to the chakra in the air itself, it's only really possible after you've used other ninjutsu to saturate the air. It's a Jonin ranked technique that's illegal to do while inside of the village to stop kids from getting hurt. You were never actually gonna pull it off. The point was that you realize that you don't have to be able to do every single thing and that it doesn't discourage you. Did you even actually create the jutsu? Oh, goodness no that's a technique that's been around as long as the other chakra sticking techniques like vertical walking and water walking. It's just a lot more rare and a lot more safeguarded. In fact, there are about 12 ninjas in the leaf village that can use it right now. And Uncle Awesome is one of them. No offense. I like the guy as much as the next person but I've never seen him as much of an overachiever. Oh, he can't use it. Why? What did he show you? He just did the hand seals and did the technique the same as you. He didn't do the same thing as me. I don't really want to explain what he did right now but all you need to know is that you won't be able to do anything like that for a while either, if ever. Benzaden said, hoping Sumahiko wouldn't ask any more questions about it. Luckily, her wishes were granted, as Sumahiko just huffed and walked to his bathroom saying, I need to take a bath, I'm exhausted and stinky, as he signaled a farewell to his mom, and left the room. Damn, I'm lucky Hanada gave me that pep talk or I might not be a ninja anymore. But what could Uncle Asuma have been doing that allowed him to stand on the air? Uncle Asuma is great at wind release but if mom said it'd be near impossible to do, I doubt even he could do it. So what could it be? And why would mom want to keep it under wraps? Sumahiko analyzed the situation in his head throughout his entire shower but when he couldn't figure it out by the time he got out of the shower, he decided to drop it for the moment. He went to his room to go to sleep for the night and after putting on his pajamas his eyes closed and he drifted into the world of his dreams. He saw a magnificently large beast. In fact, it was so big that it had appeared to be the size of a mountain. It had a monkey's head, with a white mane, the body of a tanuki the legs of a tiger, and a snake for a tail. It was growling and drooling and looked very hungry. Hey! Who are you? Sumahiko shouted fearfully, doing his best to intimidate the creature. Chakra beasts were incredibly rare, almost like a fairy tale. But Sumahiko had unfortunately bumped into the almost part of that, as it had seemed. Chakra beasts varied heavily in power and intelligence. There were the nine-tailed beasts which were the most powerful, who were all held by the five great shinobi nations and were all powerful enough to blow up the planet ten times over. Then, there was the rest, some could be seen as capable of rivaling the tailed beasts and others weren't even as strong as your average chunin. Sumahiko just had to pray it was the latter. The beast simply roared in his face before curling down and laying in the floor. Sumahiko had been shaken up but he refused to just become a victim to some ugly creature. This thing looks like something mom used to tell me would get me if I didn't behave. What was it called again? He pondered for a second. Wait, that's right. You're a new. Get the hell out of here, new. The beast stood back up simply and got in Sumahiko's face, shrinking to around the size of a large wolf and snarling right in the young man's face. Sumahiko, having decided not to die a coward, readied himself for a fight he figured he had no chance of winning. He got into his taijutsu stance and prepared for his last fight. The creature pounced at him, and he ran back at it, roaring himself. But right before they crashed, the new changed sizes once more, now looking around the size of a puppy. Haha. <laughs> Not too tough now, you little bastard, Sumahiko said. Immediately the new changed to its original size and ate Sumahiko right up. 
Fortunately for the boy, he immediately woke up. Though for some strange reason, his room had been disfigured and his bed was destroyed. Mom! Do you know what happened? Sumahiko shouted from the fractured bed. Oh! There was an earthquake but you slept right through it and I didn't want to hassle you. I'll call the contractor in a little bit, you just go out for today and have some fun. It is your last day as a civilian, after all," Benzaden said. Realizing this, Sumahiko quickly did his morning activities, ran down the fractured stairs, kissed his mom's cheek, and ran out the door. Benzaden watched Sumahiko exit and after he was gone far enough, she called her father. Good morning, Dad, we need to talk. It's starting to manifest in him," Benzaden said kind of shakily. Already. I figured we had a few more years at least. How far has he gone? Hirazan asked. Not all that much, really. His chakra just flared ridiculously hard and he ended up destroying the house, Benzaden explained. Oh, so he's only just beginning. We have a little bit before we have to tell him. Let's just let him be a regular ninja for a little while. He can learn soon enough. All right, Dad. I'll take your word on it for now. But, don't let a secret get my son hurt. Not a chance. I would never let anyone or anything harm my beloved grandson. After Hirazan said this, the father and daughter bidded each other their farewells and hung up. Benzaden just sighed worriedly. I really wish you were here, Minato. She sighed and went back to the kitchen in order to make some food and calm down. Sumahiko was sitting right back in his original school seat in his class. He was right next to Hinata and his friend Shu Yuhi. Shu had white hair, distinct red eyes, and pale skin. He wore a black jacket, a red t shirt underneath, and black cargo pants. The two were chatting while Aruka was getting ready to announce the teams that the Genin would be set in. Who do you think you're gonna be put on a team with? Shu asked, curiously. I hope I get put on a team with Sakura and Ino. Well, I don't think either of them would fall for you even if they were on your team and you saved their lives one million times, Sumahiko said, snickering afterward. I hope I'm on a team with you and Shikamaru or with Choji and Shikamaru. Shu swung on Sumahiko but he easily ducked under the attack and laughed even harder. What's with the obsession with Shikamaru? If you decided to switch to the other team, I thought you'd go for someone like Sasuke, Shu said slyly. Sumahiko replied with a flick to the other boy's forehead. It's not like that, Sumahiko shouted, to the ire of some of his classmates. I just think Shikamaru is really smart and his style complements mine really well, he explained. Whatever, Shu said in annoyance. You're forgetting what's really important. And what would that be? Sumahiko asked, sarcastically. Isn't it obvious? Shu asked, leading to Sumahiko shrugging as a result. It's the ladies, Shu shouted victoriously imagining various beautiful women behind him. You might not realize it because you already have girls fawning over you, but girls consider being a strong shinobi is very hot. I'm gonna be the. If you focus your entire shinobi career on getting women, you're gonna die early and then the only girls you'll be able to get will be in the afterlife, ya no, Hanada said, interrupting the conversation. Exactly. That's what I'm saying, Sumahiko said. Well, neither of your hopes for your teams are very likely to happen, ya. No, Hanada said. Genin teams are composed of two boys and one girl, and the higher graded students are usually put with lower graded ones to keep the team even. For instance, if Sasuke was paired with someone like Sakura, he'd probably also be paired with someone like Kiba, Hanada said, pointing at a dumb looking boy wearing a grey parka, with red fang shaped markings on his cheek, brown hair, and a white puppy on top of his head. Of course, there are some special cases like the Ino Shika Cho family or some teams that would look to have too much chemistry to be missed out on, but with neither of your situations being like that, I doubt that you guys would get those teams, yeah, no, Hanada explained. Sumahiko and Shu immediately slumped down, hearing the news. We were just wondering, Hanada, said Sumahiko. You don't always have to be such a spoil sport. After hearing this, Hanada mentally cursed herself. Damn it. Just when I was starting to get friendlier with him, I'm such an idiot, Hanada said in her head. Sorry, guys, Hanada mumbled before resting her head down. Sumahiko almost began speaking to Hanada, but then Iruka walked into the classroom. Immediately, everything became silent and the attention of the class shot to the front of the room, where Iruka was standing at the moment. All right, class, today will truly begin the first day of your shinobi careers. Starting from here on out, 
you guys are no longer civilians or members of my class. You're now shinobi of the hidden leaf. I expect all of you to act accordingly and make me proud. Never forget what I'm about to tell you guys. Each and every one of you has the potential to do great things. Between you and me, you guys have been my favorite class I've ever taught. Never lose your ways. There are gonna be people in the world that might make you question your allegiances. Remember, first and foremost, you're loyal to the Leaf Village and its people. As Aruka said this, the entire class absorbed the information as if they were sponges. Aruka was overall a pretty easygoing teacher, so the fact that he took these words so seriously made them pay special attention to what he was saying. But enough of that. As you guys have probably been anticipating, I will start listing teams. I want everyone to stand up and go to the back wall. When I select your teams, you will sit with them and wait for your Jonin instructor to come pick you up. Understood? Yes, sir. The class shouted in unison. Very well then, first off, we have Team 10, which will consist of Ino Yamanaka, Choji Akamichi, and Shikamaru Nara. Your Jonin instructor will be Asuma Serutobi. Damn. I was hoping Uncle Asuma would be my sensei. Sumahiko thought to himself. Ino is one of the prettiest girls in class. If only she wasn't so obnoxious. Choji is a pretty cool guy himself, but he eats way too much. But, then again he's one of the only guys in class who is physically stronger than me so I can't really knock his methods. And Shikamaru, that lazy bastard is probably the smartest guy the first or anyone else has ever met. If he got off his ass for once, he'd probably already be some kind of Chunin strategist figuring out how to prevent wars and things of that nature. Uncle Asuma is really gonna have his work cut out for him if he's gonna make Ino's bitchiness, Choji's gluttony, and Shikamaru's laziness a functional team. Ino usually doesn't even like to be in the same room as those two though. It's hard to believe that their ancestors make up some of the best teams when it comes to teamwork in the village, Sumahiko thought, analyzing the team. The next team is Team 5 which will include Shu Yuhi, Shino Abarame, and Yuki Serutobi. The team's Jonin instructor will be Hayate Gekko, Aruka said. That perverted bastard is gonna be on the same team as my cousin. Hopefully, their sensei is strict and will whip them into shape. Overall though, it's not a bad lineup for a team. Shu is a really nice guy when he isn't perving. He also has some pretty high physical prowess. I don't really know Shino that well but I have heard that the Abarame clan's bugs have some real nasty capabilities. And Yuki is just another demon altogether. She's good at fighting, smart, and she can use a couple of chakra natures herself. On second thought, maybe Shu is the one I should be more worried about after all. Sumahiko thought to himself, recounting the various scraps Yuki had gotten into throughout her childhood. Next is Team 8. This team will consist of Kiba in Azuka. Please say Sasuke. Sumahiko thought. Rimaru Shimura, and Sakura Haruno. The sensei of your team will be Kuranai Yuhi. Oh, come on. How does that even make sense? I really gotta be the most unlucky guy on the entire planet. I'm really gonna be on the same team as that emo bastard and that weird girl. Rimaru is just as quiet as Shino, and he's way more powerful than those guys and he doesn't have any abilities that complement theirs. Other than his raw frame and muscle power. Kiba isn't even anything impressive, and all Sakura knows is school work. How the hell are they gonna work as a team? Sumahiko thought to himself, angrily. Hanada on the other hand, was ecstatic by the realization. Sasuke and I get along relatively well, and he's got a really amazing range with his shuriken jutsu and fire jutsus and his taijutsu is impressive considering our rank. He's one of the smartest guys in our class and has some decent genjutsu skills. My taijutsu on the other hand isn't the greatest, but I can at least knock out some chakra points. And now, I can cut ninjutsus, and then there's Sumahiko, she thought as her eyes changed into the shape of hearts. He's so strong, if he just worked harder in class, he would have easily been rookie of the year. His taijutsu is incredible, his grasp on elemental ninjutsu is higher than most chunins, and he even knows a few genjutsu. He's also so tall, and sweet, and has those brown eyes, and his nice hair he's just so cool. And finally, Team 7, the team that will be guided by Kakashi Hitaki. Through the process of elimination, you guys have probably already realized it. But, just so you guys can hear it, it's gonna be Sumahiko Serutobi, Sasuke Uchiha, and Hanada Hayuga. This is a giant load of horse crap. Why the hell am I on the same team as the self-proclaimed, Avenger, and history's greatest weirdo? 
Shouldn't I be put on a team that complements my abilities better? Come on. What do these guys offer me that I don't have for myself already? Sumihiko shouted at Aruka, causing Sasuke to stand up, getting ready for a fight and Hanada to slump down once more. Well, if you must know, Hanada was ranked in the bottom of the class since she failed her final test. Sasuke and you were ranked 1 and 2 in class and as Hanada explained to you previously, teams are built by placing the worst with the best in order to balance teams and allow everyone to flourish. But that isn't even the end of it. Here comes the best part. Your grandfather, Lord Third, specially requested you to be put with some of the smarter kids in the class to make up for your lack in intelligence, Aruka said. Sasuke, Kiba, Shikamaru, Choji and Shu all immediately began laughing when they heard this. Hinata just smiled at her sensei acknowledging her intelligence. Sumihiko slumped down as tears cartoonishly poured down his face. One by one, the Jonin instructors began collecting the new genin. First off, was Kurinai Yuhi. Sumihiko had seen glimpses of her before but he had never realized she was so beautiful. Her outfit consisted predominantly of wrappings. From her thighs to her shoulders excluding her arms and from her neck to her cleavage which was covered by a mesh undershirt she had been wearing. Her right arm had one baggy sleeve and her hand to her forearm were covered with a wrapping. Her left arm however, had no sleeve. She had gorgeous red eyes and wore purple eyeshadow. Sumihiko was beginning to understand what Shu had been talking about previously. Sumihiko's imagination began to run wild, as he imagined becoming a janin, wooing Kurinai, and getting married to her. Hanada, who noticed how Sumihiko rested his head on his hands and stared longingly at Kurinai began to seethe. Kurinai picked up her team and left, Kiba making sure to stick his tongue out, make devious faces, and flick off the now visually depressed Sumihiko. Hor, Hanada thought to herself. The next janin that came in was none other than Sumihiko's uncle, Asuma. He smiled and waved at Sumihiko, who was still noticeably sad. Hey, kid, how's it going? Asuma asked, walking to Sumihiko, who immediately cheered up upon noticing his best friend. Hey, Uncle Asuma. Do you think you can pull a couple of strings and switch me with one of your teammates, please? Sumihiko said. Sorry, no can do kiddo. Once teams are selected, they are set. Besides, this is a great learning experience. You're not going to like everybody you team up with. The point is that no matter what you have to bear with it and work together to make sure that your mission is accomplished and you and your teammates survive. It'll all be fine though, I'm sure. By the way, who is your sensei? To which Sumihiko replies, Kakashi, causing Asuma to burst out laughing, making Sumihiko angry. Hey, what's so funny, as Kakashi some weak loser? Oh, no not that. On the contrary, he's actually one of the most powerful ninja in the village. He's just a very eccentric guy. Trust me you'll know him when you see him. What's funny is that he's never once allowed a team of genin to stay under him. Looks like you're gonna get your wish after all. Sumihiko fell to the floor, as Asuma walked out with his team wishing the boy good luck before leaving. The next person who came in was Hayate Gekko. He was one of the plainest looking people Sumihiko had ever seen before. He had short brown hair, wore a bandana with Konoha's symbol, and wore the signature Konoha outfit. He carried a katana on his back but that was the most interesting thing anyone would notice about him. His team quickly followed him out of the classroom. While exiting, Yuki and Shu both waved to Sumihiko while smiling, Sumihiko shot them back a grin for attempting to cheer him up. After the last team had left, Team 7 sat in the classroom. Seconds became minutes, and minutes became hours. Sumihiko began to boil. That's it. I'm gonna find this bastard and throttle him. Who does he think is taking all of this time? Aren't we the reason he's getting paid right now? I'm gonna teach this Kakashi guy a lesson, he'll never forget. Sumihiko shouted. And how exactly do you plan to do that? A mysterious voice from behind Sumihiko asked. He turned around and saw a man with white hair who wore a mask and even more peculiarly, covered his right eye with his headband, which had a gnarly scar. This must be Kakashi. Sumihiko thought to himself, making a mental note. Sasuke and Hanada surmised that this was Kakashi as well, based on the conversation they had heard between Sumihiko and his uncle previously. Kakashi disappeared in a shroud of leaves after saying, Follow me to the roof. Sumihiko, Sasuke, and Hanada did as instructed and headed to the rooftop where they found Kakashi sitting. Kakashi greeted the team with a wave and an eye smile. Alright, so my name is Kakashi and as you probably know, 
I'm your Jonin instructor but you guys can call me sensei. So in order to start team bonding, camaraderie and all that nice stuff I want you guys to introduce yourselves. We'll keep it simple though, tell me your name, likes, dislikes, and your goal. And then you guys can ask questions at the end. We'll start with the loud mouth over here. Kakashi said, pointing at Sumahiko. Well, my name is Sumahiko Serutobi. I like training, learning new jutsu, and I really like my mom's cooking. I dislike quiet people, weird people, boring people, and doing nothing. My goal is to be the strongest shinobi to ever live. And marry that smoking hot John in two, he whispered toward the end of his speech. Quite the ambitious one aren't we, Kakashi replied. Any questions? Both Sasuke and Hanada stayed quiet. Sasuke out of annoyance and Hanada out of hurt feelings. Well, I guess not. Anyway next, weird looking girl. My name is Hanada Hayuga. I like sweets, animals, and my dad. I dislike mean people, spicy food, and people who judge others without getting to know them first. My goal is to become a kunoichi who is strong enough to protect the village and the Hokage. Ah, such a saint, Kakashi said, sarcastically. Any questions for the angel? Kakashi asked once more. Once again, all that could be heard were crickets. All right, dark and scary, you're next. Sasuke grumbled hearing this. My name is Sasuke Uchiha. I don't like anything at all. I hate too many things to mention. And I have no goal. What I have is an ambition. I'm going to kill a certain someone, Sasuke said. Sumahiko and Hanada were shocked at the revelation. That's right, the Uchiha massacre. His whole family got killed by his older brother, Itachi Uchiha. But he would really even try to take down on a monster like that. Apparently that guy was gonna be the Hokage after dad if they had lived full normal lives. If Itachi did that to my family, I don't know if I'd have the balls to try to go after him. Maybe I've been a bit harsh with Sasuke. Sumahiko thought to himself. Well, that's a bit depressing. But it's important to have something to fight for I guess, Kakashi responded, sweat dripping from his forehead as a result of the tension Sasuke had created. He decided that he wouldn't even ask if they had questions this time as either Sumahiko would say something stupid and the two would try to kill each other, or there'd be just another awkward silence. Well, my first impression of you guys is, I hate all of you. Sumahiko is both unrealistic and annoying. Hinata is so boring and idealistic that it makes me sick, and Sasuke is just, well, I just don't like him. Anyway, tomorrow meet me at the training grounds behind the Ninja Academy. I'm gonna give you guys your final tests in order to truly become Genin. Our final tests? I thought that the test Uruka Sensei gave us was our final test. Sumihiko responded curiously. Well, not exactly. That test is to make sure you have the knowledge of the basics and no longer need tutelage on common theory. The tests that us Jonin instructors give are in order to make sure that you guys don't get killed on your first serious mission. Because that, would be bad for business, Kakashi said, winking at the end. And one more thing, make sure you don't eat anything tonight or tomorrow morning, I wouldn't want you throwing up during the test. Hanada and Sasuke simply nodded and went on with their days. A few seconds later Kakashi disappeared in a puff of smoke himself, leaving Sumihiko on top of the school by himself thinking about his teammates and what this life he had chosen truly had in store for him. Damn. What if someone I was really close to killed all of the Serutobi clan? Would I even have the resolve to try to kill them? What if Uncle Asuma did something like that? How would I even handle it? Sasuke's gotta have insane mental strength to even keep up the facade of a semi-normal guy, Sumihiko thought to himself. After about an hour of deep thought, Sumihiko left the top of the school and began heading home. Although Kakashi said for Sumihiko not to eat, Benzaden wouldn't have it and made Sumihiko eat every last drop of what she had been cooking that night. You'll thank me later, Benzaden said as her son begrudgingly enjoyed the meal that she had prepared for him. After eating dinner, Sumihiko gave his mom a hug and went to his bed in order to get some sleep for the rigorous test he had assumed was going to be ahead of him the next day. While sleeping, in his dreamscape Sumihiko met with the creature that had been in his dream a couple of nights previously. The creature roared in Sumihiko's face but this time, he wasn't as scared. It was roughly the size of a smaller house so he wasn't nearly as intimidating. With how big you are, I doubt that you can't talk. Tell me what your name is and why you're bothering me. The creature simply roared at him and attempted to smack him with its snake tail. Sumihiko tried to dodge it but the tail was too big and he wasn't fast enough so he ended up taking the full brunt of the hit. That's a couple of ribs, 
Sumahiko said to himself as he rubbed his chest and sides. He got into a traditional Muay Thai stance and got ready to brawl with this behemoth of a creature. He dashed towards the creature and swung at the monster with his right hand, aiming for its nose. The new disappeared right as he got in front of him. It appeared behind Sumahiko and smacked him down with his paw. He hopped up and threw a kick backward, but the monster was too fast and appeared above him, flipping. The creature slammed its tail on top of Sumahiko and sent him crashing into the ground. Ah! Damn it! What the hell is with this thing? I can't even touch him! Sumahiko's thoughts were interrupted as the creature seemingly caused trees to rise from the ground and tie him up. It began barreling toward him and ended up headbutting him, uprooting the trees it had created and slamming the new shinobi into a platform that Sumahiko had assumed to be a wall of some sort. That's it you bastard, now you're dead. He weaved some hand seals, fire style, exploding flame shots. Sumahiko's hands sparked before fireballs appeared in his hand that he began flinging at the beast. Sumahiko's flames were a beautiful sight to behold. They looked to be a pinkish crimson and had an almost ethereal nature to them. It began running at breakneck speeds horizontally to dodge the blasts but when Sumahiko decided to throw one in front of the new, the attack connected and there was a huge explosion. Ha! Eat that you furry bastard! Even some giant dumb beast like you is no match for the great and powerful Sumahiko Serutobi. Sumahiko laughed and boasted until the smoke cleared and the new stepped out of it completely unharmed, seemingly grinning at the boy. And then, it did something that shook Sumahiko to his core with both fear and rage. It began to laugh. And not any ordinary chuckle. Full gut busting laughing. Sumahiko weaved the seal for the shadow clone jutsu and created a singular clone. He and the clone then both began weaving hand seals for two completely different jutsu. Wind style. Great breakthrough. Fire style. Dragon flame bomb. The Sumahikos blasted an inferno at the distracted beast that, when it had noticed it, caused it to sweat a little bit. The two chakra natures combined to create such a torrent that Sumahiko felt his own skin burning. That'll shut that bastard up, Sumahiko thought to himself. He then felt another tree wrap around him and muttered a shit before getting launched about 50 feet and smacking the ground. Who the hell even are you? Why are you attacking me in my dreams? What do you even want from me? Sumahiko was exhausted at this point. He had never been beaten like this before other than his training sessions with the older members of his clan but even his mom had never beaten him up this bad. I want you. The creature roared. After hearing this Sumahiko woke up in his bed, albeit aching all over as if he had spent that entire night getting beaten up in reality like he had in his dreamscape. Oh, boy. This might be bad. Sumahiko woke up, incredibly sore. His bed was intact, unlike the previous encounter with the new, but he couldn't say the same about his ego. He got ready for his day and went down the stairs where he saw his mother sitting at their dining room table. It was adorned with various fruits, meats, and breakfast pastries. All of Sumahiko's favorite breakfast foods and even a few of his favorites from the other daily meals were there too. Hey, good morning, mom. You're up early. Of course, did you think I would miss my only son's exit from the house for his first team meeting? You don't have to do this to yourself, mom. I'm sorry. What are you talking about? Everything's fine. I know that you're not a fan of me becoming a shinobi. I know that you're scared that what happened to dad and your friend is going to happen to me too. I'm sorry. BT BT BT, Ben Zayden interrupted. That's all nonsense, you need to conserve your strength, today is probably gonna be a long day. Eat your breakfast and we can have this conversation another day. Sumahiko just nodded. And one more thing. Become friends with those teammates of yours. You guys are gonna be responsible for protecting each other's lives for the foreseeable future. And I'm sure you know about those two's special circumstances, they don't have to be the two closest people to you but you guys should be able to share a drink together and reminisce on your genin days when you're older. Those kids need someone kind to them more than any other person and I'm sure you understand that, Ben Zayden explained. Got it. Mom, Sumahiko said, with a mouthful of the scrambled eggs his mother prepared for him. Sumahiko ate the breakfast his mother prepared for him, grabbed his bento box, kissed his mom's cheek, and limped his way to the meeting area that Kakashi had instructed the team to attend the day previously. The dream that he had the previous night seemed to affect him in the real world. His body was bruised in multiple areas, he had multiple scratches from branches and thorns, but the worst injury of all, was to his pride. That monster had shrugged off some of his best techniques. 
That bastard is lucky I didn't use that technique. Yeah, if I used that nobody would stand a chance. Not even something like that beast. Sumahiko thought, causing him to stop limping and begin walking with a pep in his step at the thought of his secret technique. He arrived at the area and found Hanada and Sasuke already sitting there. Sasuke was hunched over, brooding while Hanada seemed to be sketching in a notebook. You greedy idiot, you actually ate? Sasuke asked. Hi to you too. Sumahiko said angrily before gasping in confusion. Wait a second. How did you know? You have syrup on the side of your mouth and you smell like a fruit salad. A blind man could see that you just feasted, Sasuke explained, matter of factly, with a smug smirk on his face the entire time. Sumahiko just grumbled and wiped at his mouth, smearing the syrup. Noticing this, Hanada pulled a green handkerchief from her sweater and handed it to him. Thanks, Hanada. You're a great friend. After wiping his mouth with it, he attempted to hand back the soiled cloth to her. It's okay, you can keep it. Just think of it as my gift to you as a team. Hanada said with a light smile and a blush. Oh, okay then. Thanks. Sorry, I don't have a gift for you but I'll get one sometime. You too, Sasuke. Sasuke ignored the boy and Hanada nodded and blushed. The newly formed Team 7 was sitting at the training field for several hours, waiting for Kakashi to show up. Sumahiko was enraged at his teacher's tardiness and hoped that the test they would take involved thrashing him. Sasuke seemed to get more annoyed and more hungry by the second, only being further riled up by the aforementioned shinobi. And Hanada who was being raised to be a clan head building spades of patience and who had also consumed her meals the night previously and the morning of had not been having the same issues. After their third hour of waiting, Kakashi finally arrived at the training area. Sumahiko ran at him in an attempt to punch him but he just grabbed him by the back of his collar and turned him around. Hey guys, sorry I'm a little late. There was a black cat on the road so I had to take a different path so I didn't get bad luck. You can never be too careful with those kinds of things. Especially when you're supposed to be risking your life every day. Kakashi explained. You, mean, I've been waiting here this whole time because of a cat. Sumahiko asked. Well, it was black. The color of the damned cat doesn't matter. I can't believe I got stuck with such an idiot for a sensei. And I can't believe I got stuck with someone who talks so much for a student. Now before I explain the test, be honest with me. Did any of you eat? Just so you know, I can tell if you're lying. Sumahiko and Hanada looked at each other, then at Sasuke, and then at the ground, before muttering an, I did, and looking back at the ground. Well, being that it's probably too late to make you guys vomit the food and that it'd be kind of gross, I'm going to give Sasuke an advantage as a reward for being the only one to follow my instructions. The two both nodded their heads in compliance as Sasuke smirked a little again. So, here's the deal. What is going to happen will be a simple test. Kakashi produced two bells from his pocket and dangled them in front of the trio. Your responsibilities are to collect at least one from me by the end of the day. Wait a second, old man. There are only two bells, Sumahiko explained. Yes, I'm aware. One of you will most certainly be going back to the academy. The Jonin said in delight, causing the three genin to freeze. He then tossed a bell to Sasuke. Since you didn't eat, your only job is to keep that bell from me till the time runs out. He then points at Sumahiko and Hanada. But, you two knuckleheads are going to have to try to get this bell from me. Sasuke then raised his hand so Kakashi could acknowledge him. What if I were to get the second bell? Sasuke asked. Well, I didn't think that you would try that but then I suppose you could choose who you'd like to have as your teammate. Could I choose to work under you alone? Sasuke asked, shocking Sumahiko and Hanada both. Sasuke, you bastard. I ought to, Hanada grabbed Serutobi's arm and put her hand over his mouth to prevent him from making the situation any worse for the two of them. I don't see why not. And one more thing. If you guys want to win, you'll have to come at me with the intention to kill, Kakashi said. Anyway, I'll give you guys till the count of five. One. The moment Kakashi began counting, Hanada and Sasuke immediately dashed into the forest in order to hide and strategize. However, Sumahiko stood right in front of Kakashi and began reaching into his weapon pouch. Ooh, how brave. Two, three, four, five. Begin. The moment the word came out of Kakashi's mouth, he ducked as a demon wind shuriken had been flung directly at his head. 
He then heard a poof as the weapon became a clone of him and threw a shuriken at Kakashi before weaving some hand seals. Shuriken Shadow Clone Jutsu. Kakashi expertly weaved through each kanai at breakneck speeds and quickly dispatched the clone with a swift punch to its jaw. Damn. Impressive repertoire for a rookie. I guess that's Minato Sensei's son for you, though. Kakashi thought to himself. He had no time to rest though as he felt a hand reach from underground and grab him by the foot and attempt to drag him underground. He was confused as he still had his eye on Sumahiko until he scanned him and realized that he had elongated his right hand using Yang release to try to catch him off guard. Thinking quickly, Kakashi weaved hand seals at inhuman speeds and called out, Earth style, mud wall, causing a wall to erect that he grabbed at the top of to keep from being pulled underground. Sumahiko's hand quickly retracted back to him as he began running to Kakashi to engage him in a taijutsu bout. He stopped right before he reached him and got on all fours picturing the creature that had been invading his dreams in his head and how it fought before attempting to replicate its fighting style. He dashed in front of Kakashi and swung his fist wildly from the right in order to attempt to overpower him. Unfortunately for the boy, Kakashi was not so easily overwhelmed. He intercepted the boy's punch by his forearm and then hit him with a punch that sent him soaring upward. Sumahiko allowed the momentum of the punch to carry him as high as it possibly could before sticking his right foot out and flipping to land a devastating kick that Kakashi dodged out of the way of, shattering the ground where it impacted. Sumahiko huffed in minor exhaustion and frustration as he saw Kakashi walk out of the dust without so much as a scratch on him. You tired already, kid? Kakashi asked, nonchalantly, lacking even a single bead of sweat. Not even close, Sumahiko said with an evil laugh wind style. Air bullet. Kakashi heard as three Sumahikos seemingly appeared out of nowhere and all blasted multiple jets of compressed wind at Kakashi. He dodged most but a couple managed to tag Kakashi and shake him up. Come on. You call that a jutsu? I've seen eight-year-olds with better ninjutsus than that, Kakashi said, attempting to rile his former master's son up in order to see what he truly was capable of. You want to see a jutsu? I got one for you. Sumahiko put his hand to his side and got into a martial arts position, covering his right fist with his left. Now, show me rock, Sumahiko said, confusing Kakashi. Rock? He thought to himself. You ready Kakashi sensei? This is my trump card. My own Sumahiko original. Chakra began to burst from Sumahiko's right hand at a surprising magnitude. The color flickered between pink, white, and brown. Sumahiko style. Jank and rock. Sumahiko cried, charging at Kakashi while still covering his fist. Kakashi very briefly lifted his headband while he was sure no one had been looking and noticed an insane concentration of chakra in the fist of the boy. Sumahiko landed the attack on his sensei, completely caving in the man's chest and creating a tornado of fire that surrounded the two. Unfortunately, the grievously injured Kakashi poofed and revealed itself to be a clone of the young man's sensei. Kakashi had been sitting on a tree branch reading a book the entire time but when the clone poofed and Kakashi received the memories he sweat dropped in amazement. Wow. That kid really beat my clone. It was only about 30% of my real power but it should still be more than enough for three fresh genin. And to create such a powerful elemental jutsu like that without any hand seals is insane. Sensei, your son is really gonna turn out to be amazing. As Kakashi was thinking this, a shuriken flew right over his head and pinned itself into the tree Kakashi had been sitting in. Why hello, Lady Hanada. Hanada wasted no time and injected her chakra into the tree Kakashi had been sitting in, exploding the base and causing Kakashi to fall. When he landed, Hanada ran at him and began trying to close his chakra points, he read his book while yawning and parrying all of the girl's strikes with one hand, though he made sure not to be too careless, lest he lose the use of his page-turning hand the tragedy that would be. As Kakashi stepped back repeatedly, he eventually noticed Hanada's smile. He scanned the area and searched for a possible trap but before he got to figure out what it was, he was lifted into the air by a net. The kunoichi leapt for the bell but Kakashi quickly grabbed a kanai and slit the ropes that were holding him before using a body flicker jutsu to escape from the cage. Kakashi then decided to show the kunoichi the gap in their levels by approaching her at her own game, using taijutsu. Hanada threw multiple fast and powerful palm strikes but Kakashi parried and weaved them all, countering with heavy, damaging strikes that shook the young shinobi to her core. 
he swept the girl by her ankles and then smashed her downward by punching her in the side and slamming her into the ground, still connected to his fist. Fortunately for Hanada, Kakashi's carelessness had proved to be fatal as the girl was able to hit multiple chakra points in her sensei's left arm. When he realized this, he remarked at how odd the numb feeling had been. Hanada took a kanai from her tool pocket and threw it at a thin ninja wire that when cut, released more kanai at Kakashi's left side, allowing multiple to graze him and one to actually open a small cut on his arm. Wow. Hanada really planned all this out just to get me to this spot. Which means she planned on taking that beating just for some possible damage. Not bad for a genin. Kakashi thought as he pushed some chakra into his arm in order to mitigate the effects of Hanada's technique. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Kakashi said, as he weaved hand seals and exhaled an orb of hell flame that was directed speedily at the girl. Remembering the lesson that her father taught her, Hanada attempted to cut the flame in half with the chakra cutting technique. But, for some reason, it failed Hanada. Hanada screamed in pain and fell to her back while holding her now charred right hand against her body. Damned kids, Kakashi said as he immediately dashed to Hanada in order to make sure that the girl was okay. Why would you do something like that? That technique is something most Hyuga don't learn till they're well into their careers. Now show me the wound so I can disinfect it. Hanada hesitantly lifted her hand before a wicked smile appeared across her face. Kakashi's eye widened as he noticed an explosive tag on the girl's shirt. He used the body flicker technique once more to avoid the blast but was still partially afflicted nonetheless. He fully pulled up his headband now and revealed a peculiar bright red eye, with three tomo in it. That's it I'm gonna start taking these kids more seriously, Kakashi thought as he scanned the area, searching for Hanada. When Hanada saw the eye that Kakashi had brandished, she was a bit surprised. Kakashi's last name had been Hataki and from what she knew, all Uchiha and their relatives with the exception of Sasuke were dead. How do you have that? That's the Uchiha's Sharingan, Hanada said, approaching Kakashi from a bush that she had been hiding in. She was hoping he wouldn't have the sinister answer that she was half expecting. Well, I don't believe that is any of your business, Kakashi retorted. Did you steal that from an Uchiha's corpse after the massacre? Hanada asked. It had been incredibly rare to find a shinobi with a Sharingan these days. Maybe you'd find one from some separate shinobi village that managed to capture some poor Uchiha man or woman but for the leaf it was next to impossible. Except for one group of people, grave robbers. Grave robbers were shinobi who would break into resting places of deceased leaf ninja and steal weaponry or belongings and in some extremely rare cases, for ninja with particular keke jenke, body parts. Grave robbers were often executed if caught as something like this would be treated as an act of treason but every so often, someone would manage to slip through the cracks and disguise the newly acquired dojutsu well enough to become a pseudo dojutsu user. Well, tell you what. You get this bell from me and I'll give you the scoop. Sounds like a deal? Hanada simply nodded and got back into her fighting stance. She ran straight at Kakashi and attempted to palm strikes him but with his new visual prowess, he easily weaved through each attack without any struggle whatsoever. Hanada used her Byakugan to attempt to find weak points in Kakashi's defense, but each one she tried to exploit would be instantly defended and countered with extreme prejudice. However, what surprised Kakashi was Hanada's extreme amount of steam, she would be hit and immediately return back. There were absolutely no signs of slowing down or weakening. On the contrary, she seemed to get faster and even more precise as the battle raged on. Kakashi noticed that hurt by Akugan had turned pink, she gained a faint slit in her pupils, her hair became wilder, and the whisker marks on her cheeks became more furled. These kids are gonna be the death of me. This girl is subconsciously using the chakra of the Ninetales and her seal is nowhere near as good as Lady Kashina's. And that taijutsu of hers is amazing. She's hitting even harder than Sumahiko was and the fluidity of her technique is almost as flawless. Kakashi thought this as he caught Hanada's arm while she did a powerful palm strike by the wrist, grabbed her neck with his free hand and swept her leg, slamming her back into the ground and knocking the wind out of her. However, this only lasted for a split second as Hanada immediately kipped up and headbutted Kakashi, hitting her head on Jonin's forehead protector but rattling him slightly. Kakashi weaved some hand seals and said, Water style, water bullet, blasting Hanada with a heat stream of water that she just powered through and shook off. Kakashi was at a bit of a loss. 
he could most certainly put down Hanada but any of his jutsu that would do this might hurt the girl a bit too bad and any of his techniques that were too weak were being shaken off by the girl. Kakashi noticed that as the battle raged on Hanada began to fight more aggressively and began to stop fighting in her traditional Hyuga stance. It started with her just throwing a few punches instead of palm strikes, but now it has become swipes as if she had paws. Fearing the worst, Kakashi quickly hit Hanada in the stomach with his knee and then looked into her eyes to cast a genjutsu on her and put her to sleep. He then pulled his headband back over his eye and began reading his book. While this battle was raging on, Sumahiko decided to go find Sasuke and make an offer to him. After looking around a bit without any success, he decided to change tactics and started setting the forest on fire. After feeling the heat and seeing the flames, Sasuke decided to find the source of the fire and found Sumahiko lazily sitting on a tree branch he hadn't yet set ablaze. What the hell are you doing? Sasuke asked. Sasuke, just the man I was looking for. I want to propose a team up, of sorts. Now, why would I want to do that with you? If I have all the bells or just keep this one, I'll be able to advance with no problem. Well, you see, here's the thing about that. I'm down to about half of my chakra and the Kakashi I fought was a clone that was much weaker than the real one. I'm sure you've seen glimpses of Hanada's fight and she's fighting at a level that neither of us are capable of and he's still clobbering her without much difficulty. If I try to fight him, he's gonna beat me and the only person left will be you. With nobody else to distract him, he's gonna find you, take your bell, and then we all fail. However, if we work together and take the bell from him, the test ends and at least one of us will graduate indefinitely. Sasuke took what Sumahiko said and began to weigh his options. The guy had a point, even though it would be annoying to work together with him. However, he did know that he was more than strong enough to at least serve as a distraction for Sasuke to get the bells. Then, he'd never have to work with him again. Fine, you have yourself a deal. Okay, but I do have a single condition, Sumahiko said. Trying to forge an alliance but having conditions is strange, but, just in case I would humor you, what is it? Well, if you get the bell, I want you to give it to Hanada. She pushed herself really hard and she at least made him sweat enough to make it slightly easier for us to fight him. She deserves it more than I do. So as long as you give it to her, we'll work together. Sasuke simply nodded before saying, All right, so we're gonna work together. But do you have an actual plan? Sasuke asked. Of course, Sumihiko said before detailing the idea that he had come up with when he sat down and waited for Sasuke. After about 45 minutes of complete cold, Sumahiko appeared from some bushes and charged at Kakashi, exploding multiple fireballs from his mouth. Kakashi easily weaved past each of them but what surprised him was when he heard a clang as a molten shuriken flew at the back of his head. He ducked beneath the blade but winded up with another sticking out the back of his flak jacket. He looked up to see Sumahiko preparing more shuriken to throw. I read over all of you kids' files and you had the worst scores of them in shurikenjutsu. Are you sure you're Sumahiko? Sumahiko just ran at Kakashi and engaged him in another taijutsu bout. He threw a left kick at Kakashi that was blocked and caught. He then threw a right punch that Kakashi used his left hand to catch. Finally, he flipped, making Kakashi loosen his grip, and attempted to slam his right leg into Kakashi's head but was once more blocked, leading him to be thrown. This has to be Sumahiko. There's no way Uchiha could fight like this and not have had the highest taijutsu grades in the class. Kakashi thought, as he leapt over a powerful leg kick Sumihiko sent his way. Serutobi then started weaving more hand seals before shouting, fire style, dragon flame bomb. The blast nearly incinerated Kakashi but he responded by casting another water bullet to extinguish the flame. Then, another Sumihiko came out of a tree and flung a kanai at the string attached to the bells on Kakashi's hip. Distracted, Kakashi didn't notice until the bells hit the ground. The first Sumahiko attempted to jump for the bells but Kakashi had been faster and grabbed the bells first. Damn. This kid almost caught me off guard, Kakashi thought to himself. He grabbed two shurikens and threw them at both Sumahikos, but when both shouted in pain and neither poofed, he realized there was a problem. Alright kid, so which one of you is the real one? But then, he began really processing the fight that he had with Sumahiko previously. Sumahiko's fire ninjutsu had a different color than what he was using now. And, he fought a lot more bestial and less acrobatic. Then, the Sumahiko Kakashi had been fighting previously ran at Kakashi and blasted him with more fireball attacks. 
Kakashi dodged through all of them but was surprised to see the other Sumahiko run at him under the cover of the flame. This Sumahiko put his hand to his side in order to form the jutsu he had used previously, but to Kakashi's shock instead of a fist of flame, Sumahiko made the scissor symbol and created a blade of wind that cut through the strings of the bell. Sumahiko style. Jankin scissors. Sumahiko shouted proudly as the other one changed into Sasuke. Both pre-teens immediately dived for the bells and grabbed them lifting them in triumph. Kakashi just sat there, sweating. He was in awe. These kids came up with a pretty damn good plan and even got one over on a Janin. If they would have included Hanada in this team up, Kakashi would have passed them on the spot. While Kakashi thought to himself, Hanada made her way to the group where she saw Sumahiko and Sasuke glowing with pride. She smiled sadly but did her best to keep her composure. Congratulations guys, she said sadly. You two were really something else. We're something else. Hanada you're insane. You pushed Kakashi on your own way more than me or Sasuke could have ever done. We probably wouldn't have even gotten the bells if you didn't push him so much. That's why I want you to have my bell. No, I couldn't possibly. You and Sasuke worked for those. Yeah, you couldn't because I'm giving her my bell, Sasuke said. You came up with the plan and she kept him busy for the longest so I played the smallest role. Well, if you're giving her your bell, I'll give you mine. A deal's a deal and men honor their word. Besides you don't have to be the cool guy all the time, Sumahiko responded, to the chagrin of Sasuke. That's enough, all of you pass. The test I gave wasn't for you to grab the bells. The truth is you guys weren't even supposed to be able to get them, but I guess I held back on you a little too much. The real reason I gave this test was to see if you would work as a team. While Hinata did fail to do this, Sasuke and Sumahiko had wild success and actually managed to impress me. And then you all were willing to sacrifice your positions as a ninja for each other so I believe you all qualify as shinobi in my book. Sumahiko cheered, Hinata smiled happily, and Sasuke remained stoic. Just remember this. In the life of a shinobi you're gonna be forced to make a lot of difficult decisions. You'll have to kill people who don't deserve to die, you'll have to let murderers run free in order to make sure a mission isn't compromised. This world isn't superheroes and supervillains, nor is it black and white. This world is a grey place where you'll question why you took this job. But remember, no matter what happens you must always hold this one virtue sacred. Those who break the rules are scum, but those who would abandon their precious comrades are even less than scum. As Kakashi spoke these words the area began to feel tense. The three kids listened to every word Kakashi said with extreme care as both a sense of invigoration and dread grew in their chests simultaneously. They all signified to Kakashi that they understood and went to a ramen shop called Ichiraku Ramen to get dinner. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.